Hey everybody, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are out there. My name is Doc Severson with Ready, Set, Trade. Today is our 10X Tribe coaching session that we open up to the public once a week. And we're doing this on Tuesday, the 13th of April. If you folks are uh, joining us live, go ahead and uh, let me know where you're coming in from. Where's your location? If uh, you're watching this on an archive, uh, which probably most of you are, welcome aboard. Glad that you're with us. Either way, make it seem like it's a live session, all right? You could be watching this a year from now. Never know. All right, so today is one of my favorite topics. It's about charting and technical analysis. A lot of a lot of opinions on this topic, a lot of uh, witchcraft, and uh, a lot of uh, just different opinions that are out there on what we have talking about. So let's jump right into it here. All right, so we got uh, Willis uh, from Michigan, Gretchen, Michigan. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's see. We got Savvy Desi from the Bay Area, California. Welcome aboard. Good to see you. I myself am uh, coming to you guys live from Greenville, South Carolina. We've just about hit summer here. It is absolutely gorgeous outside. We've got all the azaleas bloom. If you've seen the Masters, if you watched the Masters this weekend, we've got basically the same type of weather, the same type of plants. Everything is blooming right now. It is my favorite time of year for all this. And uh, getting some work done outside. All right, so let's get into um, our topic today. Again, if you're live, if you're joining us here, just uh, go ahead and chat in, say hi. Let, let me know where you're coming in from. Okay, so today, I'm going to hide myself down in the lower left-hand corner. Today, technical analysis, what is it? What approach should you be taking? Okay, rather than just diving right into the techniques, I've got a few, I guess, editorial comments on this topic because it is such a subjective topic, as always. It's turned into a, a secular religion within the business of trading. It really has. And <clears throat> anytime you talk about religion, you lose all objectivity with things. And, you know, this is where things break down because people are either going to hold one of many different opinions and nobody agrees with anybody else. So the pit traders look down at their nose at it. They, pff, oh yeah, you guys out there using charts. I mean, if you look at this, this is the CME trading pit. There is not one trading chart out there. This is the chart, which is the trading floor. That's where the price discovery is actually taking place. And this is where, this is the true underlying of the S&P 500. And even if you go to the CBOE, Chicago Board Options Exchange, you will not find any charts throughout the whole building. Hey, Coob, man, you're, uh, you're traveling all over the country this week. Chattanooga, Tennessee, you're not too far from us here. So you won't see any charts at all on Chicago Board Options Exchange. All you see is just numbers everywhere you go. Black and orange numbers, that's it. Black background, orange numbers. So should you chart or should you not chart? Well, it depends on what you think, what you believe, right? Professionals have historically poked fun at retail chartists using technical analysis. They believe that charts belong at the bottom of the ocean with all the other sunken galleys that are out there, right? But this is because the pros could see, they could feel, they could even smell the price discovery happening right in front of them. I mean, when you're standing in the same place every day and you see the same order flow coming in and out of the floor, you know exactly what's going on. That's your price discovery. You can tell people's emotions face to face and what's going on. You can tell if somebody's scared and trying to puke out their shares. You can tell if somebody is, is you know, really aggressively buying in. All right, Dan, Liverpool, very cool place. I was able to visit there a number of years ago. Very, very cool. In more ways than one, right? So this is the, the pros could, could see this price discovery happening in front of them, which you can't do when you're just looking at a chart. That's the big advantage that professionals would have leasing a seat on the floor. But then these same pros 
right? One by one, they've left the floor. Either they couldn't find the same advantage or they just got tired of paying the seat fees or they couldn't afford it. They left the floor, they went upstairs, and all they had was the same order flow materials or charts, and they would struggle. So trading pits are quickly becoming obsolete with the majority of executions occurring electronically. They still have some pits that are out there, but most of them are, yeah, I don't know if they're going to go away anytime soon, but the majority of the price discount or the, price, the order flow is happening electronically. Hey, Stephen, welcome aboard. So meanwhile, retail traders have always been on the outside and charting was the only real way to see what was happening to the price in a visual way, in a visual format. It's the only price, it's the only form of price discovery that we truly have, unless you're just doing, you know, reading order flow right off the tape. So actual TA, technical analysis price charting, has been around for less than 100 years. Pinard by Charles Dow and organized and amplified by his disciples in the 1930s. This is where they sort of read through all the man's papers he had passed on by that point, and they organized all of his thoughts and started to apply them towards charting, and people actually would put them on a price chart. So this has not been around for that long as, as compared to the length of the, the time in the markets. So charting, as we know today, has been placed... I would say since the 1960s, this is where a lot of the derivative price studies was coming on board, like the MACD was was uh, created by Gerald Appel in the 1960s, and this is where in the 1970s is where Wells Wilder came along and did his uh, ADX and RSI and those kind of things. So the 60s, 70s is where things really started to come along in terms of charting the way that we consider it today. So most retail traders still treat this topic, again, like a religion. They're looking for the holy grail to find the signal that never loses and always leads to wealth. We think that it's somebody's holding on to some magic study that's out there. And based on the way that I just said that, maybe you can get an idea where we're going today. So in today's presentation, I'd like to show you that how most of us go about this journey and how a few have emerged at the other end. Perhaps this is a voyage that you'd like to take as well. Hint, hint, yes, right? Okay. Uh, the first thing I want to cover is the trader progression. It always goes back to the mindset. If you can't get your mindset right, it doesn't matter what style of trading. It doesn't matter what techniques. It doesn't matter what strategies or methods or anything. And just the nature of the progression really shows you what is required to be successful in this business. And I hope that you'll get the point that I'm trying to make here today. Because again, most of us, most of us come from scientific backgrounds. We're engineers or lawyers or architects or, you know, some type of technical fields. You know, we're good at putting little pieces of information into the right boxes, right? So the square peg goes into the square hole, the round peg goes into the round hole. We do this all day long. And we get really, really good at it. And we think that the same logic applies to the markets. Not quite. Not quite. So let's go through the progression. The trader progression is a term that was coined by a gentleman by the name of Bo Yoder. I think Bo lives up in Maine somewhere and he makes videos while he cuts his lawn and he's just kind of a folksy kind of dude. And he came up with this progression that was perhaps uh, like 15 years ago when he did this. And I'm just going to walk you through this one step at a time. And I want you to listen for where you think that you might be. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to hide myself down here, off here, because I think I'm in the way of mystification. So mystification is the first stage of the trader progression. This is where everybody begins. You have no idea what you're doing. This is where I see most of the people that are trading today, and there's a lot of brand new folks that have hit the market lately. They jump on through Reddit or Wall Street bets. They jump on through different forums, mostly through social media, mostly through Twitter. They see people talking about how much money they make, and they jump on board, they get a Robin Hood account, and off they go. They have no idea what they're doing. They're just, they're social investing. They're basically doing what everybody tells them to do. But as you know, the most important part is not necessarily where you enter, but where you exit. 
So mystification occurs. Trading can be really simple in a bull market. Everybody thinks this is a piece of cake, just ape in and, you know, all these silly terms like diamond hands and stuff like that. Mystification is where everybody starts. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know why you're making money. It feels good when you do. And when the market turns, as it most certainly will when everybody apes in at this point, you have no idea how to protect your gains. You have no idea how to, how to risk manage. So it's a phase that everybody starts with. And basically, your goal is just to survive mystification. Now, once you get past mystification, you get to this area, which is called the hot pot. The hot pot stage is the next stage that you get to. So what you've done is you've graduated from mystification by learning about some techniques. All of a sudden, you, you know more about the market that you're trading. You know a little bit about charting because that's what retail traders do. You learn a little bit about order flow and you learn about some different setups. You identify different markets that you're going to trade. So you've started to narrow down. You're not out there just trading, you know, Forex one minute and futures the next minute and crypto and then trying to trade options or something like that. You've started to understand what it is that you do a little bit to the point where you actually have a setup that you watch. And so the hot pot, basically what it it uh, intimates is that we've all learned as children, when you touch a hot pot on the stove, that it's immediately hot, right? And it's just, you get a reaction off of it. Ouch, that hurts. So what happens is in the hot pot stage, you watch something, you watch a setup, and you start to get good at it, or at least you understand what's going on with that setup. And you watch it, and you watch it, and you watch it. And every time that the signal fires off, it's a winning trade. And you watch it, and watch it, and watch it, and it's a winning trade. And so now you've gotten the confidence up to put your own capital in. And you're so confident that the next trade, you put your entire account into this one trade. It's a small account, but you put the whole thing in. What happens? It's a losing trade. And so you're like, oh man, I can't believe I just did that. You know? And it's, you joke to your friends like, hey, if I ever enter something, you might as well take the opposite side of the trade. So what you do is you go back to the drawing board, you watch it and watch it and watch it and watch it. And sooner or later, you get out of the confidence, you take one more entry and it's a losing trade again. This is the hot pot stage. What you're doing is you're waiting for you're waiting for the market to feel good. And ac actually waiting for the setup to feel good means that you're trading with the herd and you will never win, well, I would say not never, but you will find it very difficult to trade in that manner because you have no edge. You're trading with the herd and the herd is going to get faded. You're waiting for everything to feel good. And so one of the things you have to learn through time is that you have to take the setups that feel bad because if they feel bad, if they feel like you have to grab an air sickness bag as soon as you enter, you're probably doing something right because that's a contrarian entry. So the hot pot stage is out there. It's something that takes a while to graduate from, and that leads into cynical skepticism. Now, I can identify somebody that's in the cynical skepticism stage because it's everybody else's fault. Every time that they lose a trade, it's somebody else's fault. Hey, it's Jerome Powell's fault. It's the inflation. It's the printing money. Ten years ago, it used to be Ben Bernanke's fault. Then it was Janet Yellen's fault. Then it was the damn market makers. If they quit printing the money, it was the plunge protection team. It was everybody else's fault but themselves. And... I, fought, I see people get into this trap of, like, every time that they take a trade, they, they get smacked. And again, it's because they're trading not to lose instead of trading to win. They're waiting for the good setups, the good feeling setups. And at this point, what they're looking for is a scapegoat. They're looking for somebody to blame it on. Now, some people can't ever get past this phase because they cannot accept personal responsibility for their trading results. It's either the guru's fault or the market's fault or the Fed's fault or the market makers 
or the broker's fault, it's somebody else's fault. They don't take personal responsibility for every trade. And the people that cannot take, assume personal responsibility for the trades eventually will fail. They will, you know, die out of this thing. And on their way out the door, they're going to tell the whole world how they got screwed. And you can spot these people a mile away. I can spot somebody like this within the first sentence of talking to them, right? These are very, very common stages that people get trapped into. Okay, if you survive that stage, and some of these hopefully are sounding a little bit familiar to some of you, right? If you survive this stage, if you get past the point and start to take some personal responsibility, you get into the squiggle trader phase. The squiggle trader phase is you can tell somebody is in this because their charts, and I'll show you one of these in a minute, but their charts look like this. They got you know, the, the MACD study down here, they've got ADX down here, they've got an oscillator over here, they've got the Arun oscillator here, they've got every study known to man. And way up here at the very top of their charts, they have a little bit of the price showing. And if they could get rid of it, they probably would. And this is what the squiggle trader is. The squiggle trader stage is where I find most people stuck in this. This is stage number four. And it's, I just need one more study. I'm looking for the Holy Grail study that's going to allow me to win every single time and never lose again. It's that feeling that, oh, I'll, I'm just going to add this one study. And if everything lines up just perfectly, then I'll take the trade. And what you find is that you get analysis paralysis. You cannot pull the trigger because nothing is perfect and everything looks weird and You've obfuscated what's going on in your chart, and you just can't, you can't find a way to make a decision. So this is where I find a lot of people in. They're looking, they're constantly looking for the, the perfect setup, the perfect study, the perfect chart setup, the perfect time frame. They're looking for the right underlying to trade. And then on top of that, they've, they're looking for the right magic strategy to trade options with or the right setup to trade futures with. So people generally stay in here for a, an extended period of time because they're trying to find themselves. But what the real issue is here for most of this is fear of loss. They're trading scared money. And so, again, they're trading not to lose instead of trading to win. And learning how to trade to win is actually some, something that nobody teaches that's out there, right? It's, it's these constant, um, you know, we're sold the idea that we just need to add the right study or the right strategy or whatever. And that appeals to us because it sounds easy instead of actually doing the real work. And what you have to do is you have to understand that we are not taught to trade effectively coming out of the... Coming out of the womb, right? Since we're little kids, we're taught not to risk anything. Oh, Johnny, don't run across the street. You might get hurt. Oh, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't think you should date that girl. She sounds risky. Or don't ride that motorcycle. That's a risky activity. So we get this pounded into our heads from a very young age that risk is a bad thing. And then what do you think we do when we get to the markets? We carry the same things over there. We carry the same things into the markets. Risk is bad. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people. Hey, Doc, what is the safest strategy that's out there? I want to make money, but I don't want to risk anything. Ah, I know the answer for you. It's called mutual. It's called money market funds, right? Certificates of deposit. That's the answer for you. Right? No risk, no reward. So we have to retrain our brains on how to use risk as a tool. And if you can't do that, you'll never get anywhere with this because everything will seem like an attack to you. Everything will seem like it's a bad idea or you'll pull out right, you know, right on a, when a trade's about to become successful, you'll take it off the table. And you can't understand why you do that because you haven't taught yourself and handle how to handle risk yet.
So the squiggle trader is something that people spend an inordinate amount of time in this phase. And they know a lot of people. I can tell, I can talk to a squiggle trader all day long about techniques and they can, you know, they can go to parties and they can tell people about negative divergences and they can tell you about, you know, hidden divergences and they can tell you about advanced decliner lines and market profile and VWAP and, you know, you name it, they can burn your ear off and all the technical techniques that they know, but they're not making any money because they still haven't gotten over that issue of risk. They're still trying to trade not to lose instead of trading to win. Now, this is where we get into the next phase, which is called inwardly bound. Once you identify that you are the biggest issue not the market. You're not trading versus the market. You're trading versus yourself. You are trading versus yourself. That is the biggest opponent that you have, is yourself. Once you identify that, once you come to grips with that, like, wow, it's me. I'm the problem here. How can I fix this? And I got, a news, I got news for you. It's not in another study. It's not in a different strategy, right? It is yourself. It is your own mindset. Once you identify that and you pull back and you say, ah, okay, it's me. How should I start over again? This is when you can start to actually get somewhere. And the inwardly bound is where you learn patience, is where you strip your trading down to the tip of a spear and you choose one thing. And this is where I, I'm always telling people, and I, I apologize if I'm going a little long on this, but this to me is the issue for everybody. You've got to pick one thing. What is your one thing? Think of the movie City Slickers with Curly. And if you haven't seen that movie yet, Go on to YouTube and search on one thing, Curly City Slickers, and watch a two-minute segment, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. What's your one thing? If you can't identify what your specialty is, then you will not have a specialty, and you will have no edge in the market. When people trade in the SPX pit, they, they occupy one square foot of real estate on the risers. They stand in the same exact spot. They stand there all day long. Maybe occasionally, you know, they'll, they'll grab lunch or something like that, but basically they own that one square foot of real estate. They will focus on one option, one strategy, one chart, that's it. And that's a professional because they own that. So my question to you is, if you're struggling, what is your one thing? What is the one thing that you can take to the market and say, you know, this is my seven iron. I know that if I'm about to hit a ball over the lake, I can grab my seven iron and I know I'm not going to chunk that thing. I'm not going to hit a worm burner. I'm not going to drive it right into the lake. I'm going to hit it nice and soft over this lake, 150 yards every single time. What is your seven iron? So you've got to have that. And this is where you find it. You don't find it down here or down here or down here. These are all stages that you have to go through to get to this point. And then, of course, once you figure out what your one thing is and you put, you know, put some years into this, you can hit your mastery. All right, so let's move on here. Everyone overestimates where they truly are in the progression. Literally, everybody comes up to me and says, oh, I'm inwardly bound. I'm inwardly bound. Okay, if you were inwardly bound, you'd be making money by this point. You'd have one strategy, you'd have an idea of where you are. Most people are usually stuck in squiggle trader or cynical skepticism. And again, you can, you can talk to these people and all it takes is one paragraph and you can understand where they are. Because everybody goes through the same progression. I went through the same progression. Everybody does. You cannot skip a level. A lot of people say, well, pfft, I, you know, look, I'm smarter than that. I don't need to go through that crap. Yes, you do, because you have to treat your mind as your biggest opponent. You have to get over yourself. You can, however, minimize your time in the lower levels. You can minimize your time. Probably one of the smartest guys I ever traded with 
worked as a supply chain director for a great big consumer products company. And this guy's brain was like supply chain, right? Was able to minimize everything down to the smallest level, understand root cause, understand what was causing his losses, fix that, not do it again. It was incredible to watch this guy because he would he would apply circular logic around here. Try it, get a result, fix the result, right? What corrective action do I have to take? This is the reason why they put a steering wheel on a car. It's because we're always correcting, trying to go straight. It's why if you fly from LAX to Hawaii, you're off course 99% of the time, but you're able to arrive right on that little square where it says, put your front tire right here on the ramp because we make corrective action all the time. So you can minimize your time in the lower levels. You will hit the inwardly bound level and start to enjoy consistent success when you learn to create your own approach to the markets, one that your own subconscious mind does not consider to be a threat. If you take one of my trades, you will consider it to be a threat. For those of you that are actually taking the trades that I broadcast in the platform, congratulations, I could not do that. I find it very difficult to do. You take somebody else's trade and immediately your brain starts protesting like, oh my God, it's not working out. We better shut it down. And I can, I can see that all the time. I hear people say, well, you got a profit. I, I took it off too early. That's right, because it's your own subconscious mind going, warning, danger, warning, danger. This is somebody else's trade. That is your opponent, is your brain, guys. Okay. Hey, Andy. Welcome aboard. Good evening out there. Well, it's getting late out there in Ireland. All right, so number two, determining your approach. What is your approach going to be? Most people that I work with are stuck in Squiggle Trader, and this is what their charts look like, <laughs> right? This is what their charts look like. I don't see how you can make any kind of decision based on what's happening here. It's that temptation to add just one more study to your chart, and all this does is obfuscate and obscure what you're trying to determine in the first place. So here's something that you must understand, and may, maybe this is going to be a shock to some of you out there. Technical analysis is not meant to predict the future. That's what everybody wants to know, right? This is why we tune into news programs, because we want to know what's going to happen next. This is why the most popular videos that are out there are the ones with the big clickbaity titles on there saying, crash right around the corner, or here comes the big rally, because people want to know what's next. But technical analysis is really not meant for that. It's best used to give yourself a decision-making framework for trade entry and maybe even trade exit. It's not for predicting the future, guys. It's for making decisions. So catch yourself. Next time you find yourself following somebody, see if you can divorce yourself from the need to know what's going to happen in the future. It's just a trade setup. Once you identify a trade setup, that gives you a positive expected return, you're not sitting there going, oh, well, what happens if I lose on this trade? Oh, no. And, you know, pay attention to that internal dialogue because if you're sitting there waiting for something to feel good, it's probably the right, it's probably the wrong setup. If you have to take a trade and go, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm taking this trade, and I'll do this in the room too. I'm human, just like everybody else. I'll say, well, guys, uh, this is a really aggressive trade, and this is probably not going to work, but the signal fired, and I got to take this. I, ca I can't tell you how many times I've had to say that in a room. I'm like, here it goes. Here goes nothing. The signal fired. I have to take this. And then it works out perfectly. And more often than not, the signals that fire and show, wow, this is like the you know, let's double down on this one because this is the perfect signal. Those don't work as well. Okay, so if you're trying to determine what the price is doing, why are you adding so many derivative studies to your charts? Make price the central 
focal point of your decision making. So I'll now cover the four step system that I've used for the last decade. So it took me several years to come up with this approach to simplify what I was doing, having gone through the same journey as everybody else, I have made every single mistake that's possible to make out there. The only difference is I've tried to learn from those and not make that same mistake again. That's the only difference. So this is what I call the four-step system for fractal energy trading. I'll give you four steps and then four rules. And before I get into this, I'm not saying that this is the system. It's just a system that works for me. This is what I've kind of cobbled together over the years. This is my one thing. What I want you to do is I want you to listen for ideas that, you re that resonate with you and see if you can maybe bolt something on here and add it to your system or maybe use it as a foundation for your system. I don't want you to use the same system. I'm not saying that you should, but go. Ahead. this is what trading is all about. Trading is all about, it's the same ideas, guys. Nobody has any new ideas. It's all the same stuff. It's how people assemble that to fit it within your own mindset, your own belief system. So four steps to set up, four rules to implement, one ring to rule them all. Step one, set up your charts with the fractal time value series and the chop index. Again, these are not what you have to do, but this is what I am doing. So what, what I would do is, what I want you to see is at the minimum, I want you to add what's called an anchor chart. I'll just put a big A here for anchor chart. This is a larger time frame. This shows you what direction the trend is going in. And then I want you to add a secondary chart, which is faster, which is called the signal chart. This is for your entries. This is to almost like a microscope where you can zoom in on something and see where you should enter. But basically what you want to do is trade in the direction of the anchor chart swing. Remember that little rhyme, trade in the direction of the anchor chart swing. Never forget that. If you do that, you'll trade with the trend. You will win more often than not. That's step one. Step two, understand the trend state of each time frame that we're monitoring. What you're going to see is something like this. If we do the same deal here, if we have anchor over here, and if we have signal, so here's anchor, signal, and if we have something happening like this, so anchor is just pulling back, is it not? But if we look at the signal chart, the signal chart's gonna look like this. Like that little, that little pullback here is gonna take on greater significance. And what we can look for is we can look for ways to identify the very first turnaround in that. That's step two. Understand the trend state of each time frame that we're monitoring. Step three, understand the energy state of each time frame that we're monitoring. In my world, I do not believe in overbought and oversold. What a shock, huh? This is something that we're fed based on the 1960s where the oscillators overbought, oversold, Hey, that's overbought. That should turn down. When has overbought meant anything in the last, since 2009? It hasn't. We've had 13 straight years of overbought becoming more overbought, becoming even more overbought. And it just doesn't matter anymore because of the money printing that's going on. So overbought means absolutely nothing. Now, oversold sometimes will, will create some nice signals. Oversold can be because tops are a process, bottoms are an event. Remember that one, tops are a process, bottoms are an event. Bottoms tend to be very spiky, especially with the amount of liquidity that's out there sloshing around the gutters of today's financial system. So understand the energy state of each time frame. What does this mean? Range expansion, range contraction. Range expansion, range contraction. Everything moves between expansion and contraction. What do we do every day? We breathe, we expand, and we contract. Expansion and contraction. If you're running up the side of a mountain, you're going to go as far as you can. Expansion, 
and you're going to you're going to be grabbing your your sides. You're going to have a stitch in your side, right? As far as you can go, you know, you're you're bent over double. You're just about to puke. <laughs> you've got to you got to stand there and catch your breath. This is contraction, and then once you get your breath back, off you go again. It's the same way that humans work. It's the same way that every system is out there. Markets are just another organism. Expansion and contraction. This is all that things do. And then from that, once you put all this together, you can develop that fractal forecast in terms of your decision making. Okay, so what's this four rule? So let's, let's drill down a little bit on the four rules for fractal energy trading. Rule number one, larger time frames dominate the trend. Just remember that. Larger time frames dominate the trend. The way I like to present this is if you're walking your dog from point A to point B, let's assume that your mass, unless you've got a Great Dane, let's assume that your mass is maybe 10 times the size of your dog. So if you walk from point A to point B, if you're like me, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking with my head down and I'm just going the straightest route from point A to point B. Meanwhile, my dog, unbeknownst to me, is taking a more circuitous route all over the place, basically orbiting around the leash, trying to mark everything that they possibly can within the orbit of the leash. Now, we arrive at the same place at the same time, but we take a much different path. This is the difference between an anchor chart and a signal chart. An anchor chart is going to just be, it's just a singular trend. It's just a big move. But within that big move, you can see a lot more detail. With that smaller entity, the smaller time frame, it's just like the dog. So is there a way that I can identify when the dog is moving in the same direction as me? He's moving away from me and then this the leash stretches out and then all of a sudden boom they start moving in the same direction as me again and that happens until they start to you know once again so you can look for these types of entries for this it's the same thing just like a chart you already know this stuff you guys already intuitively know these things nothing that i'm saying here is anything brand new you all know how to walk a dog but you haven't thought about it in the same time. So larger time frames dominate the trend. <clears throat> Number two, reversals start from the inside out and they propagate higher. Now, usually the, the analogy I use with something like this is a virus. So a virus enters your system, finds a host cell, replicates, and those replicating, and I, I'm I don't want to get in trouble here because I'm not a medical professional. So if I'm getting it wrong, I'm sure somebody will correct me in the chat. But basically what happens is it starts to replicate and the new virus that replicated finds another host cell. And this is how you get this exponential. So you get one virus and all of a sudden you hit a wall and you're sick because your immune system is overwhelmed. So it didn't happen all of a sudden. It happened from the inside out. If you've ever driven a, uh, been driving a car for a long period of time, every single day, you drive it every single day, you don't notice big changes or little changes that are happening to it. And then somebody else gets in your car and you're like, whoa, man, your brakes are terrible. This thing pulls to the left. It slips into second gear. Why don't you maintain this thing? And you're like, well, I never noticed because... Little changes happen all the time. You don't notice them, and they propagate until it starts to become something big. Reversals start from the inside out. So if we're using this in the context of the anchor and signal charts, so again, here's our anchor chart, signal chart. If we just have this anchor trend, if we're just watching this anchor trend, and this is typically where people are just watching the daily chart. That's all they watch is just one single daily chart, and they pile 16 indicators on there. They're not seeing the signal chart, which is doing something like this, all of a sudden has changed polarity. 
and has flipped into a downtrend. And they're not watching that because all they see is this. But somebody that's watching a signal chart would say, oh, warning, we have a potential reversal happening here. And they've got a flying start on the rest of you that are still buying at this level. So they're, they're in there taking profits, especially if this creates a lower high and starts to roll over. Reversals start from the inside out and they propagate higher. Now this one's really simple, descending patterns. And we can see descending patterns typically have some type of a trend line like this. They will always reverse higher. It's physics, right? It has to happen. Descending patterns will always reverse higher. They'll break to the upside. Nobody says how far they have to go, but they will break to the upside. And then you have the same thing in reverse. You have ascending patterns, which will eventually break to the downside and break that trend line when they do that. You can see charts like this on a monthly chart. You can see intraday tech chart showing the same exact thing. It happens over and over and over again. It's not a signal. It's more of a filter. And then rule number four, we talked about this one. Range expansion leads to range contraction and vice versa. Markets go from coiling and consolidation to range breakouts. They can go in either direction. This is why we need to watch price to understand which way the breakout is occurring. Okay, so let's show these in action. Here's again our apparent time frame. Anchor chart on the left-hand side, we have a signal chart. Signal time frame, all we're seeing from the anchor chart, this is a daily chart, we just see a nice trend to the upside here. But this is showing us all kinds of detail. And here's like a, here's a, a, a typical pattern here, actually a little bit of a head and shoulders pattern. Higher low, breakout to a higher high, here's the entry at this point. Also rule number three, descending patterns, breaking to the upside. We can see this. We can't see this over here. This is tough to see because we just see these candles, you know, junk together. Range expansion, range contraction. Range expansion, range contraction. So learning to use at least two different time frames. Sometimes I'll use four, but that's very rare. Quite often I'll use three. It took me a while to learn how to use three. I would start with two. Just starting with two time frames will increase your accuracy. I typically will use a factor of five to break up the different time frames. So like a, in this example here, we have monthly chart and the weekly charts are basically about five times faster, four and a half to five times faster. And then the daily chart should be if we're just trading markets that are open five days a week, they will be five times faster than the daily, or the, I'm sorry, the weekly chart. So consider this a family of time frames. You've got the largest time frame, you've got a second large, these are the parent time frames, and then you've got child time frames, and they're all separated by a factor of five. Why choose 78 minutes? Okay. If we look at this, we have, let's look at these different time frames. So if we have a monthly time frame like this, we have a weekly, they're separated by roughly factor of five, yes? And then we have a daily chart like this, separated by roughly a factor of five. Now, within a day, what you have is you have 6.5 hours. Or I'm going to get the old HP out here. If we have six and a half hours, this assumes a 9.30 open to 4 o'clock close. So that's 390 minutes. Okay, and if we divide that by five, what we're going to find is that 78. It's 
So I was the first one to use that 78, and I've seen that a lot of other places too. All of a sudden, it's just like it's just like magic. It explodes everywhere. Hey, you have to have a 78-minute chart. That's all it is, just a factor of five from the daily chart. So I, it's, it's rare when I actually go to four panes like this. I, I will only look at this just occasionally just to see if I can get a, a quick read on that just to see if something is like a major, major trend. So right now would actually be a good time to use that just because the fact that we have the S&P just ripping, ripping, ripping. And the 78-minute chart will show the first reversal off of that. So we have this market that's just doing this kind of right. And the 78-minute chart, that's the first reversal off of there. With a lower high, and a lower low, this creates what's called a change in polarity. So think of this as parent time frames and child time frames. And what we'll also talk about is like 25x, 5x, 1x. 1x is always the signal chart that you're taking the signal off of. 5x and 25x, these are anchor time frames. So I'm going to stop the slide war here and work off of charts for the rest of the four rules. If you have any charts that you want to take a look at, uh, this would be a good time to uh, just go ahead and throw a ticker out there and we can take a look at it and see what we have. While I'm waiting for that, let's just look at the S&P. We have one single swing, one huge swing in the monthly chart. We've been going higher on this thing since the, the low in March last year. However, we also have closing in on an exhaustion figure down here the likes of which we haven't seen since the end of 2017, early 2018. Okay, there's danger here. There is danger here. Now, looking at the weekly chart, what I'm seeing is, this is kind of interesting because every, every upswing has the same signature to this. Strong off the bottom, short covering. Thick in the middle, consolidation. Range expansion, range contraction, leading to a parabolic tail. We're forming the parabolic tail right now. Now, how high that goes, nobody knows. It is the very toughest thing to determine in technical analysis. Like, it could, it could go on for another 500 points. We don't know. Now, what are we seeing here? We're seeing the same thing. We have range contraction right up here, range expansion. This is an extremely low value right now. We have a daily fractal showing less than 22. When we get those, when we, get those we typically will get a reaction. That's the same one that we had here. We got a reaction, a weekly reaction from that. It's the same one that we had up here. We had a, re a weekly reaction off of that. This is a very dangerous point in the chart. I'm not saying it's going to reverse and crash, but we are begging for a correction at this point. Notice that I will start over here and work my way in this direction. Always start from the top down. Okay, somebody was asking for CRM, which is uh, salesforce.com. Okay, so what, what kind of a trend do we have here? Do we have an uptrend or a downtrend on the monthly chart? And this is where we get into the conflict of different time frames. They will show different signals. What we have here on the monthly chart is still an uptrend, believe it or not. This is not a downtrend on the monthly chart. This is just a big pullback to a swing test, which is about 200. Swing test is known by this. Former resistance becomes new support. That's a swing test. So we still have an uptrend on the monthly chart. What's rule number one? Larger time frames dominate the trend. Yes. But as we go down to the weekly chart, what do we have here? This is a downtrend. This is a downtrend. Lower highs, lower lows. Now, fortunately, this is just a big, big consolidation pattern. This is just a big bull flag. But 
it's been in this bull flag for a long period of time. Right? So can you trade inside of a larger time frame pattern? Yes, you can. You don't have the anchor necessarily working for you. So all you can do is just trade inside of the larger pattern. So here comes, you know, here's this. Now, what did I say about rule number three? Descending patterns will eventually break through to the upside. Descending patterns will break to the upside. Now notice this, range expansion, this expanded to the downside. Range contraction, big energy. Look at this as just kind of like a fuel gauge, like full and empty down here. Now this move has gone from fully consolidated to exhausted to the upside. So there is a high likelihood that this will just sort of die up here near resistance. This is TD Ameritrade Think or Swim. Okay, so we're closing in on, on our last one. Uh, let's see, take a look at crude oil. Crude oil is an absolute mess, right? So this is just, this is actually a monthly downtrend. Now watch out for this because descending patterns will break to the upside eventually. Is this the one? I don't know. Is this the one? But keep in mind that we have a fair amount of energy. So we do have a weekly trend going in this direction. We do have a daily trend going in this direction. This is just a consolidation at this point high degree of energy here and not bad. So I would watch carefully for any kind of break above this level, any kind of break above this level would be very strong. Now, this is also exhausted to the upside. This has been such a strong move. I would expect to see this thing probably, Stephen, probably consolidate here for a few months in this area before it had the energy to break out. So again, top down, do your analysis top down on this. Okay, the last one is BTC. And quite honestly, I'm going to, I'm going to steal trading view over here because I don't really have a good view on, on Bitcoin, on TD Ameritrade. I, there's the futures, but I don't think they're, they trade as well. So this is just the spot index on Bitstamp. And this is a beautiful, as you mentioned, this is a beautiful, ascending triangle pattern here, breaking out. Now, the only concern that I have on Bitcoin, and this is not multi-time frame, is where's the volume? Normally on a, on a breakout like this, this is the type of volume that you wanna see. Volume shows that somebody's taken it in the shorts. Somebody is in pain. Price movement requires pain. Somebody's gotta be in pain to move the price. Either shorts are covering, or pain can also be, I'm sitting on the sideline, the market's breaking out without me. That's incredibly painful. Oh no, here it goes again. I can't, you know, I can't be on the sideline. I've got to chase this. And this is what happens to most retail traders. It's not fear and greed, guys. It's fear. Fear is what moves the market. So I like this a lot, man. I'm looking for volume though. Volume is missing on this breakout today. So if this if this can't get anywhere, then what this is gonna create is, is just a rising wedge pattern. And rising wedge patterns are actually bearish. So if this can't get any further today and it can't go any further on higher volume, then it's gonna be a failed breakout. Very important for the volume to be there. It's just not there today. Okay. So I just want to uh, thank you guys for hanging out with me here today. I've, I Hopefully I've showed you something that maybe you haven't thought about or you haven't heard before. Just some new ideas that are out there. I've been doing this an awful long time. And I've made every mistake in the book, right? I've had to learn from that. I've had to figure out how to fix myself. And then almost at gunpoint, people have said, well, fix me too. So <laughs> that's, that's how this happens, right? So 
You've got to understand, though, the one thing, if you can pick up just one thing from today's session, is your biggest opponent is you and your ability to think differently. If you think like every other trader that is a brand new retail trader, and if you try to use the same techniques that work for you at work, if you're a programmer or something like that, and you've got to understand that the market is going to see right through you. And your linear logic, the market does not care about your linear logic. Hey, uh, good earnings yesterday, so the price should be higher. Market doesn't care about your logic. It laughs in the face of your logic. You have to think differently. And if you can't think differently, if you can't adapt, adopt, improvise, then you're going to be, you know, left behind by the market train, just like everybody else. So I'm trying to show you guys that it's, it's a little bit different challenge. It's not just what platform that you use. It's not like, oh, you've got to be using Robinhood or you've got to be using Webull or things like that. People obsess over the smallest things, right? Everybody majors in minor things. Major in the major thing, which is your brain. Think differently about risk. And the best way to do that, the shortcut to doing this is to simplify Simplify to one thing. Decide today what your one thing is going to be. And with that, if uh, if you're not already on board, what I would encourage you to do is to go join our free tribe out here at elite.readyset.trade. If you go straight out to that site, you can see this big join button, and it's free. You can just hang out with us. We will not spam you. We'll, we'll give you some good stuff that's out there, access to free classes. We're just trying to build a community and help people. That's it. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. And uh, let me know if you have any questions down the road. And you guys be good. Take care, everybody. We'll see you around.